am telling you, I, I don't know what he would have done with a baseball career, but I know what. He is knocking the devil right out of the park, that's for sure. Well, we're appreciating him. We'll talk to him later. Right now, we have one of the most amazing speakers worldwide and people, Simon D. Bailey. He is an author, a speaker, voted one of the top 25 speakers in the world, founder of the Brilliance Institute, and his latest book, and I've read it, and it is tremendous, Release Your Brilliance, Simon T. Bailey. Thank you. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Simon T., I can dress, but I'm telling you, those threads are really special threads. Yes, they are. Oh, Simon T., tell us about Brilliance. I, I was so taken by the book. And uh, how did you get started on this? Yeah, Brilliance is your insight. It's your potential. It's your genius. And one day I was talking with my pastor, and he asked me, how are you doing? And I said to him, I said, if I had white skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, it would be very easy for me to succeed here in America. And he said to me, you weren't born to fit in. You were born to be brilliant. And the moment he said it, it unlocked something in me because it was literally a word from the Lord. And no one had ever told me that I was born to be brilliant. So when he said it, I said, whoa, that's different. Mm. And he said, you're stuck in your mind and your body thinking the pigmentation of your skin is holding you back. When you understand who you are and whose you are, it releases you to be brilliant. Now, if we go all the way back, what was the stirring in your spirit to, to receive Christ? How did, how did that whole experience happen? Wow. Well, I am a son of a preacher man. Uh -huh. I grew up in the church on the altar back when the mothers used to say, give them your tongue, call on Jesus <laughs> until something happened. <laughs> I was in church every time the doors would open. So I really grew up with a love for the Lord, a love for Christ. Mm. And eventually, around the age of 13, I realized I couldn't get to heaven on mom and dad's coattails, mm. that I had to have a personal relationship mm. with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it's changed my life forever. Yeah. Now, as the pastor told you this about brilliance. What was the seed then of the book? Was it that your transformation had created in you this desire to release other people? Absolutely. So I went to my laptop and I literally started writing the book, but I wasn't writing a book. I was processing years and years of layers being put on me, being told what I couldn't do, who I couldn't become. So literally I was processing and crying. I would be driving the work and all of a sudden tears would just start flowing out of my eyes because I realized it's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're not that holds you back. And sometimes... Sometimes the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, would have us focus on who we think we're not instead of who we are. So when that, that slight shift took place, all of a sudden I was processing. I said, wait a minute. Everybody has the potential to be brilliant. When God created us, he encoded in our DNA the ability, the gift, or what I would call the God-it factor to be brilliant. And when you tap into that, you become unstoppable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that DNA, b beloved, Jesus said, now we are the sons and daughters of God. So help us unpack that. How do we get in touch with who we really are? Well, that's a great question. Let, let me anchor it with a little research. When I wrote the book, The Release Your Brilliance, I based it on some of the work of Dr. Howard Gardner, professor of education at Harvard. Dr. Gardner says that children up until the age of four are operating at the genius level. The same group of children were studied in their early 20s and only 10% were so operating at the genius or brilliance level and in their late 20s, early 30s, only 2%. So the question is, where did the genius or brilliance go? It didn't go anywhere, but it became buried by a society that says color within the line, sit down, give it back, you can't do that. So the more you continue to hear what you can't do, where you can't go and who you can't become, there's a neurological path that's created in the brain that causes individuals to shut down. So what happens is, People go through life and they have the potential, they have the genius of God in them, mm -hmm. but in order for it to be released, mm -hmm. you have to be in an environment where you are celebrated, not just tolerated. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what if, uh, what if somebody feels stuck? They feel stuck, they're, they're not in a place where they're celebrated. 
how do they get over this uh, feeling that they can't get out of this box? Yeah, so if people feel stuck, one of the things we have to realize, as the scripture says, death and life is in the power of the mm. tongue. So you have to start speaking to the future you intend to see because the future is created in the present. Yeah. So the first thing they must examine their language because language impacts your self-image, your self-concept, and literally what you walk into. So we must drill down. The average person Mm -hmm. uses two to three thousand words. If we were to drill down even more, there are 200 to 300 words, according to research, that we use on an ongoing basis. So when I change my language, I change my life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, would that mean, uh, how many words would we speak a day? Huh. We, there are 60,000 thoughts that come in our mind. If we think about that, half of those thoughts become words. Wow. And those words create our future. Wow. So if I want to understand where you're going, I just need to listen to what you say. Wow. So uh, since women talk more, they can create a bigger future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you yeah. roll with that one. <laughs> Well, life and death are in the power of the tongue, so they're going to get greater, I think, in that. When, when you're dealing with the persistence in life, saying, I, I can't go back, I, I can't change what was, but how do we say, I can start a new day? Today. Sure, sure, sure. There are four questions that every person must begin to answer. The first question is, where have I been? Why am I here? Mm. What can I do? And where am I going? Mm. That second question, why am I here? The backstory behind that question is the greatest tragedy in life is not death. The greatest tragedy in life is to be alive and not know why. Yeah. So when I answer this question, why am I here? It then taps into, so what can I do? The, the prophet says to the woman, what do you have in your house? She says, I have nothing except. So when I begin to understand everything I need to succeed in any season, God has encoded it and put it in me. Mm -hmm. Then when I move to that last question, where am I going? And the reason that question is so important, some people plan their vacations better than they plan their lives. Yeah. Any person yeah. that can plan the birth, death, and resurrection of his son is a planner. Mm -hmm. So literally, if we have God's DNA, God mm -hmm. wants us to create a plan to begin to walk into the destiny and the brilliance mm -hmm. that he has for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, calling those things that be not yes. a as though they were. Yes. Now, when you do that, is there any particular discipline you would use in your prayer and imagination along with your confession? H how would you do that to... Yeah, one of the things that I teach is this whole concept of upgrading your verbal software. So if language is the software of the mind, whenever there's a new product that comes out on the computer market, there's an upgrade in the software. When we think about our language, if we take 15 minutes a day and chunk that 15 minutes down into five, five, five. The first five minutes, the first five minutes to meditate. Think about what am I going to say? The second five minutes begin to bring it to speech, but tie it to emotion. What happens is it sends a message to the neurological system mm. that everything and all the cells in our body has to realign and there's an internal alignment for external execution. In other words, the moment I bring something to speech in that second five minutes, it's, there is an alignment of head, heart, mm. and hands. And when there is an alignment, mm. Mm. when there is an alignment of head, heart, and hands because of speech, it has sent a message mm. to my emotional system, to my neurological mm. system, to my physiological system. Because sometimes mm. you can say things, but it hasn't registered in your mm. physical man. Yeah. So literally, the moment you begin to say, and so shall it be, something begins to stand up on the yeah. inside of you. And what happens is, I believe, Pastor, we are in a season of release. And the yeah. word release, the word release mm. is a timing word. Mm. So, for instance, if we were to walk through a door and the door has sensors, it's automatic. The moment we step on the sensors, the door happens. And I believe what's happening in the spirit is the moment we bring to speech that my release is here. Before we get there, the door is open. Yeah. It's yeah. open. And we just walk through. Simon, I, I think what you're doing is, uh, is somewhat revolutionary because those of us who have taught faith, been in faith for years, uh, so many times we've learned, now feelings aren't important, feelings aren't important, but you're talking about alignment with your heart also. Yes. So if you can feel it, you can heal it, right? Yes. Yeah, so yes. tell us how then can we keep that feeling 
where we want it to be, or maybe we don't have to do a giant step, maybe just a little step from where we are is a higher feeling and we get going for the day. How do we do that? One of the things psychologists teach is this whole thing called calm commotion. When you are having moments in your day and you feel like everything is flying off, you come to a place of silence. You come to a place of meditation and you get a, get a picture on the movie screen of your mind of the happiest day in your life. In other words, God takes Abraham out and he says, see what I have given you, see the land. Yeah. So he begins to get a meditation of what he's about to walk into. Well, in that silent state, what you're literally, your head is coming in alignment with your heart and your hands are coming in alignment with your heart and your head. So literally you have what Rabbi Kushner talks about is emotional congruence because I've come to a place of silent. The same letters that spell the word silent spell the word listen. Yes. So when I understand how to get silent in my spirit, then all of a sudden I bring to speech what I sense the unction of the Holy Spirit is bringing out of me oh. and literally from the uh, from your gut you begin to feel it in your gut that something yes. is getting ready to move yes. something is yes. getting ready to change oh, something good. is getting ready to happen and then literally you shift yeah that, the shifting is so vital uh the great tennis star uh, agassi said that uh, when when he couldn't win these tournaments it was because of his mindset mm. and he said he started to think what's a happy thought for me and he would think back of a certain victory, and he said it pulled him through, and he began to win all those tournaments. So uh, the shift, now I know most people listening probably think, oh, the shift, I, I don't know if I can do that shift thing. <laughs> uh, haven't we got to be somewhat happy with a little progress at first, instead of making these huge giant leaps? A little becomes a lot uh. over a long period of time. Uh. Sometimes we just have to put a f one foot in front of the other, but we also need to understand what shift really means. Mm. Shift really means see how I fit today. And when I see how I fit today, I literally realize that I am creating tomorrow today. And when I arrive in tomorrow, I call it today, but everything that I did yesterday meets me in tomorrow and says, welcome, we've been waiting for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, something else I, I, I got from you was that, like, people say, well, practice makes perfect, but a lot of people practice and they don't get better because they may be practicing uh, their weakness. Uh, you're teaching practice, uh, get in on your strength, your strength. What is your core anointing? When you operate in your core anointing, I'm not threatened by you because you're in your lane. And when you're in your lane, you are releasing the brilliance or the glory of God. But there are many people, bless their hearts in the body of Christ, yeah, yeah. who are out of place, well-meaning, mm. but they're out of place. And the more you're out of place, you block the anointing and the brilliance of God from flowing through you. But the moment you just make a slight shift and understand this is where I'm supposed to be, and the anointed person comes in there, then yokes are destroyed yeah. and the burdens are broken. Oh, that, that's so good. I, I, I hope they're hearing. Get in your place. Get in your place. And, and some people, like in the church, when they're out of their place, we had one person once say they wanted to do hospital evangelism and hospital of prayer and all that. And they went in, and the first thing they said to the patient was, boy, you really look awful. And I thought, well, she's out of her lane. That, that's not the lane for or She's got to be taught. So... How can people, if they feel again, maybe they're stuck in a lane. Maybe, maybe there are kids listening tonight and they think, uh, mom and dad don't understand or maybe dad's absent. And, and, and how do I get around this environment that Mr. Bailey's talking about? I, I want to be somewhere where it's positive, where I can be encouraged. But uh, now they start with their own vocabulary, right? Sure, absolutely. There are three questions that they must begin to answer. Number one, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? Number two, what would I do if no one paid me to do it? And number three, what makes me come alive? The quality of your questions determine the quality of your answers. The quality of your questions determine the quality of your thinking. The moment you ask a question, it immerses you on a quest to discover an answer that was waiting to emerge. So they've got to begin to ask mm -hmm. profound questions. Then they need to come to a place and just practice three words where they say, you know what, I've been doing this, but now I'm ready to let it go. And when I come to that place, what I'm doing is I am saying that I release the need to 
pe to be a people pleaser, to let people look to me, and I'm going to now do what I am anointed to do. If I never get a pat on the back, if I never get any money in my hand, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. And when I do that, but it starts with questions. And coming and ans asking questions allows you to put truth on the table. And when you really, really honor the truth that, you know what, this isn't working. And here's what you'll discover. You release the need to be right. Mm. And the moment you release the need to be right, you let it go. Mm. <laughs> the release again. That's it. The release. My, my, my. Now, how do we move from the place of release on one thing and then maybe we thought oh here it is again now I've got this other thing I'm working on now when you said you started to sit at that computer and you went back over the years in your history the tears began to flow you must have had several type of releases right mm -hmm. Leading to a wholeness. Can mm -hmm. you unpack that? For yeah, what I realized is that God was trying to bring me to a place of brokenness in order to walk me into deliverance. Because whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. So, so he had to deal with me at that level to break me down, to have me come to a point to realize I had to release the need to be right, that I didn't have all the answers, that though I had been in the church, my name was on the roll, but was I really plugged in? And so as I begin to walk through that, what I realize is through the power of praise and worship. When you get into a worship atmosphere, literally something begins, the fallow ground begins to break up. Yeah. Because what you're discovering in worship, you're discovering your worth Ship. Yeah. So when I am when I am worshiping, I'm discovering how worthy am I to be in his presence. So the more and more I begin to walk through that, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one that's brilliant. God has called a lot of people to be yeah. brilliant, yeah. but they stay, they stay in ignorance yeah. because they won't allow themselves to be broken. You should come mm. to a place so much so where you don't need an organ, you don't need a singer. There's enough worship in you that you can literally feel the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, we were sitting in the back before we came out, and you were listening to uh, Todd Del Delaney's praise, and uh, you, were, you were praising the Lord. And uh, instead of being all uptight before coming out, isn't it a shifter when you can say, yes. thank you, Jesus? Yes. Everything yes. changes, doesn't yes. it? Yes. But take it a step further yeah. because I deal with a lot of people who are professionals that work in corporate America. And to be able to walk in a place of business and say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, it just kind of fills yeah. the atmosphere. Yeah, it does. <laughs> now, Simon, with what you're doing, it's, it's obviously a crossover because you're, you're dealing with psychology, mm. uh, you're dealing with sociology, uh, you're dealing with educational formats, you're, you're getting into the world. Uh, how do you see the church now? Are, are we crossing over like you're seeing for brilliance to make evangelism work? It is my belief when we look at church history over the last 100 years, we've had many movements in the church from the evangelistic movement to the teaching movement to the prophetic movement to the apostolic mm -hmm. movement. I believe the next movement of God is marketplace. Mm -hmm. God wants men and women to go into the four corners of the world in the marketplace and say, I'm not here to chase money. I carry the anointing and money chases me. Yeah. Uh, I believe God, I believe God is unleashing, God is unleashing in this hour an entrepreneurial anointing in the body of Christ. For those who have been out of work, for those that have an idea to say God has given me a God idea and we're going to help go employ believers to become all that God has called them to be. Marketplace, marketplace. Marketplace. When, when Paul was on Mars Hill, and, and that was a marketplace for philosophies, uh, you would think he would probably judge uh, the cultish leaders. And he said, I perceive that you're religious men. He tried to find a ground that was common for them. Now, in your book, Brilliance, anybody can read it yes. from anywhere or any background and say, wow. That's me. Isn't that a start toward Christ? Absolutely. I wrote the book as a Christian for people who may never come to church mm. because my life might be the only Bible that they read. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, as you see us moving toward this entrepreneurial release, do we need a lot of genius, education with it, or is it, is it simply persistence? How, how do we do this? You know what? Isn't it interesting when we look in Exodus, God says to Moses, what do you have in your hand? Yeah. I believe pastor, every pastor that is listening to us from around the world, everything you need is in the house. How do we begin to leverage the brilliance in the house mm. and begin to bring those who may be educated, those non-educated, and begin to work together so that we oh. might become a powerhouse for the kingdom of God? Yeah. yeah. Every part of the body. Every part. It's right underneath our nose. It's in the house. Yeah. And every joint giving supply. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. So this isn't just idealism. It's realism. Absolutely. It's realism. Yeah. It's in the house, and we have to tap into it right now because there are people who have been displaced mm -hmm. in this economy. There are people who have been laid off. There are people who are saying, you know what, I'm doing okay, but I want to do better. And how do we begin to say, you know what, there is brilliance in the house. How do we release the glory of God and usher mm -hmm. in such an economic uh, powerhouse that there will be no one wanting for anything? Oh, uh, Simon. Simon, that is great. Simon, I have all these questions on my sheet. I haven't gotten to one question. You're so full of substance and, and, and so passionate. But I really think that so many people would like a direct hookup, a direct connect to the substance, the deposit of God you have in you. I believe it would be so great right now if we take advantage of the power of prayer and we long for your prayers. The body of Christ needs them. There might be people tuning in that are Buddhist or atheist or Hare Krishnas, and they're wanting something tonight. You have something for everybody, the way you express Jesus. Would you pray for us? Yes, son? I will. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my sister, my brother from around the world who is saying, I have more in me, but I've come to the end of my rope. God, I ask you to touch them right now, to tie a knot, to hang on, and to realize that this is their moment, this is their hour, this is their season to walk into brilliance. I thank you for the release that is happening in them right now. This is your hour, this is your day, because I've already seen your future. And you are brilliant. Oh, my. Thank you. Now, go to your phones right now. Call that number on your screen because there's somebody that loves you. They're volunteering their time. They want to see this release really happen. This prayer touched your heart. Now, follow through. Do something about it. Let today be that first day of the rest of your life. Make a move now toward your phone and call. Somebody's going to pray you through. Simon T. Bailey, you are...